All right, let's rip, rip into it. Who's, uh, who's ready to learn how to set fields? How does everyone, before we get into it, how confident do you currently feel with your, um, your ability to develop plans and set fields when you're either A, bowling or B, captain? Sorta, of, six out of 10, four out of 10, pretty confident, all right, horrible. Seven, okay, no good. I'm a captain, so yes. Look, it, it's probably from what I've seen, guys, both in the nets at training and you know games that I watch, it's probably something that's really, really lacking in junior cricket. I don't think enough um, thought goes into it, but I also don't think it gets coached well enough or you don't get taught this early enough. All right, so as you can see there, welcome to the ACI Cricket Lesson, How to Set Fields with myself, Coach Fitzy. The outline for today, guys, this is what I'm going to go through. I'm going to talk about knowing your game and understanding your game and why that's important, okay, and how to go about, I guess, gaining a deeper insight and a deeper understanding into your own game. The second thing I'm going to talk about is once you know your game and you've got an understanding of your game, I'm going to talk about how to develop um, plans around your strengths, all right? The third thing I'm going to go through is I'm going to talk about four key questions that you need to ask yourself when you're setting fields. I can see Callum there wrote, we don't get to set fields or choose fields. I, I know some teams, it's, you know, the coach sets it or the captain sets it without um, talking to the bowlers or even sometimes the coach sets it without talking to the captain. I'd really, really encourage you to try to talk and try to have him put into your fields. Um, and if not, at least go through this process in your head and go, right, if I was setting the field, this is what I'd do. Um, the fourth and final thing I'm going to talk about before we go into a quick Q&A is I'm going to talk about common mistakes that we see players make when setting the fields. All right, so let's go. The first thing, know your game. I think this is really, really, really important. Right, and it's something that does develop with, with age and with experience. So it's pretty obvious the more you more cricket you play, the more you train, the deeper understanding you're gonna have of your game. Right. You're gonna have a lot more data to work with than when you're you're young and you're new to the game, right? You're still finding your feet, you're still developing the game. Your game does change a lot in those early years. So from 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 you obviously grow a lot, you get bigger and stronger. So your game does grow and develop over that period. But as you get older, as you get more um, experience under your belt, you need to have a really good understanding of your game. So you can see there, self-awareness is key. No two players are the same. Right? You need to develop an, an understanding of your own game, both technically and mentally. Right? The way we do that is that you want to be constantly reviewing your game. Right, so always analyze yourself after training, always analyze yourself after games. And you can see the little picture I've got there on this slide. That's a process that we do after every single session that we have with our academy programs. Right, you can see Seb and Joel there. The players have all got their own little player diary. And we ask them at the end of every session, what were your focus levels like? What did you do well? What do you need to improve on? And how exactly are you going to go and improve on that? All right. It's a five to 10 minute process. It doesn't take a lot of effort. You can even do it in the car on the way home from training. It doesn't have to be a, you know, sit down and write in a book job. But the whole idea is to actually bring to the forefront of your mind what you're doing well, what you need to improve on so that you start to really learn about your game. All right. The more you do that, the more data you have, you go, right, I'm, I seem to be doing this well week in, week out. That must be a strength of mine, all right? Now, the third thing there, develop plans. So once you've done this, once you've got that data, once you start to go, right, these are my strengths, these are my weaknesses, what we want you to do is develop plans around your strengths, okay, which is what I'm going to go into now. Now, strength-based plans, what does that mean? What it means is you want to develop a plan A, okay? So all things going well, what's your general plan as a bowler? Right, and that's going to be different for an outswing bowler, 
compared to someone who bowls fast and hits the deck hard, hits the deck hard and gets a lot of bounce compared to an in-swing bowler that bowls a little bit slower but bowls nice and straight compared to an off-spin bowler compared to a leg-spin bowler. So your plan A for those types of bowlers is going to be different, but you need to have a general understanding of what you're trying to do when you come on to bowl and what your role in the team is. All right. Number two there, you always need to be willing to adapt. Okay, so just because you've got this plan A, it doesn't mean you can't go away from that or tweak it or change it slightly. Okay, and that the things that can cause you to adapt are conditions. So, you know, a wet pitch, a really hard dry pitch, overhead conditions where the ball's swinging, a wet ball. So if there's been a lot of, a lot of rain around and the ball's slightly wet, that's obviously going to change the spinner's plans, isn't it? Okay, it's going to be a lot harder to try and get a lot of revs and rip and turn on the ball. They might just turn into a, you know, holding up an end and bowling dot ball. So things like that you need to take into consideration when you're thinking about your bowling plans. All right. As a bowler, you need to develop a go-to strength. All right. Now, whatever that is for you, like I said, I named a few before. For me personally, my number one strength was swinging the ball. Right. I didn't bowl rapid pace. I didn't get a lot of bounce, but I did swing the ball really well. All right. For some of you on here, the level you're playing, you might be really big and tall compared to other players and you might bowl with more pace and get lots of bounce. What do you think your, your strength is? Pop it in the chat box. I want to see where you guys are at, what you currently think about. Is it swing? Is it pace? Is it bounce? It might even be consistency. You know, you, you're probably not going to go and play international cricket just because, you you know, you bowl consistently. But I've seen guys that bowl 110 Ks an hour. They don't swing it a lot, but they've done really well at Premier First Grade Cricket because they've bowled on the same spot over and over again. All right, so you need to be aware of what your number one strength is, and that's what helps you develop this strength-based plan. All right, and that, as we move on, I'll explain how that, plays a part in um, helping you decide, you know, what, what your field is, All right? You can see there, number number four, in reality, you, you really need probably two or three strengths to play at state and international level. Like I said, you're, you're not just going to be able to bowl consistent line and length and make it to that top level. You're not going to be able to just bowl fast. Like there's lots of guys in premier first grade cricket that bowl fast but they don't move the ball, they don't have consistency, so they don't get to that next level, all right? Same as me. I swung the ball really well, but I wasn't as, as fast as some bowlers and I probably didn't get the bounce and consistency, so that's what stopped me for, from going to, you know, that really, really top level, all right? So be aware of that. You probably need to develop at least two of those, probably three. Like you look at Pat Cummins, for example. He bowls really good pace. He swings the ball. He's got excellent consistency and he gets good bounce. So he ticks off all of those. Or Nathan Lyon, he's got really, really good consistency. He drifts the ball and he turns the ball a lot when the conditions are in his favour. So he's got a few strengths as well. And that's why they play at that top level. All right. An example general plan. Again, a lot of this I'm just going to relate to my plans and my thought process because that's an easy way for me to present. But an example plan that I used to go out with was I'm going to swing the ball away. I'm going to bowl a fuller length and a straighter line to get the batsman to play as much as I can while the ball's new and swinging. All right? So I used to open the bowling. That was my plan. Straight lines, fuller length, get the batter playing as many balls as possible. Does that make sense? Does everyone feel like they've got a clear general plan at the moment? Awesome. Now, what I'm going to go into here, guys, is this is this is a little process that I used to go through in my head. So it's a mental process that I went through, um, and it's it's basically four key questions that you need to ask yourself. So every time you get called on to bowl, every time you get the ball in your hand, or if you're a captain, you obviously do this for every new bowler you bring on. All right. So, 
Question number one that you need to ask yourself is where am I trying to bowl the ball? That's the first thing you need to know. If you don't know what your plan is and you don't know what lines and lengths you're trying to bowl, you, there's no way that you can set a field. You've got to have clarity around that. You've got to know what your plan is and where you're going to bowl the ball 95% of the time. Again, an example there is I'm going to bowl fuller, I'm going to bowl straighter, and I'm going to try and swing the ball away. All right, so it's a really simple, clear plan. And then that allows me to move on and ask question two. All right, actually, before we go, what lines, what lengths, and what do you, you guys normally try and do as a general plan A? What do you try and do? Do you hit the deck and bounce? Do you try and bowl outside off stump? Like, for example, if you're a second change bowler, you might bowl outside off, and that might be a really tight line. But for a new ball bowler, you want to bowl it off stump and make the batter play. For an off-spin bowler, you're going to try and bowl outside off and turn the ball into off stump. Some people have said Yorkers. Ryan tries to scare, so you're trying to hit the deck and bowl fast. Full on the stumps is a general, pretty common plan in junior cricket. Good length outside off. Off stump line, Glenn McGrath length. Yep, so you're all pretty clear on the lengths and the lines you're trying to bowl, which is great. Question number two. This is what you need to ask yourself now. So this is going a little bit deeper. This is pretty advanced stuff, guys. So take down some notes. I'd probably suggest writing down these four questions so you don't forget them. So now what we want to think about is if I execute, what shot is the batsman or batter most likely to play? All right. So you need to picture in your head, if you bowl your perfect ball, you execute your full ball on off stump, swinging the ball away, what shot is the batter likely to play? All right, I actually used to visualize that in my head, what shot they're gonna play and how I wanna get them out. All right, so for my example, if I execute my plan, I bowl fuller on the off stump, nice and straight, they're gonna to look to play, they're gonna to have to play, and they're probably going to look to play off the front foot and drive the ball, right? Because I'm trying to bowl a fuller length. So now that I know that, I need to say to myself and ask, ask question number three, if I execute, how am I most likely to get a wicket? So again, I visualize in my head, right? If I nail that ball and I get it nice and full, on off stump swinging away, what's the most likely outcome? Okay, and my answer there is caught behind the wicket's probably the most likely outcome. All right, you'll know because having played and having bowled that way for a, you know, a long time, you'll start to know, right, this is how I get my, my wickets most of the time. So for me, it's caught behind the wicket most likely. And then the next ones are probably LB and bowl because I'm bowling a straighter line. I'm trying to make it so the batsmen have to play. So if they miss, I hit, they either hit their pads or I hit the stumps. So it's Nick's number one, LB and bowl. Right, once you've actually, before we go on, pop in the chat box, how are you guys or how do you most likely get your wicket to the moment with your current plan and the way you bowl? Pop it in the chat box. Bowl, bowl, chop, chopped on. You get most of your wickets chopped on. Who said that? Lost it. Caught in the covers. Yep. And one thing I will make mention of, guys, it, it, it'll it change as you get older. You'll start to get more conventional wickets. At the moment, you probably don't get a lot of caught by on the wicket. Number one, a lot of you probably aren't quick enough to carry the slips. Number two, in junior cricket, even if you do have slips, a lot of the time they get dropped because it's a hard position to field in. All right? And some of you guys probably don't even play LBW, depending what age group you're playing. Um, so a lot of you probably do get bulbs. You probably get caught, you know, in front of the wicket a lot because batters are hitting the ball in the air. You'll start to get more traditional and conventional wickets the older you get and the higher level you play. Rightio, the last question you need to ask yourself, all right, when you're thinking about setting your fields, is what field settings 
can I use to encourage the batter to play a high risk shot? So if I go back, sorry, with question number three, once you know the answer to that, you start to set your field. So for me, the first thing I want to do, if I'm most likely to get caught by on the wicket, I want to make sure I've got enough slips in and a gully. All right. From there, I fill in the gap. So the standard, you know, standard positions in the field. And then we go into number four. What field settings can I use to encourage a batter to play a high risk shot? And you can see on the right hand side there, I've got a couple of micro questions for this one. So these are just little sub, sub questions that you ask on top of this bigger question. So you see there, where is the batsman strong? So the reason I ask that question is because if I say to myself, what field settings can I use? And I go, right, I can leave cover open. But this particular batter I'm bowling to is really, really strong through the covers and he just smashes me every time I bowl that line and length. Then I'm probably not going to go with that plan. All right. The other thing you need to ask yourself is what is a high risk shot against my bowling? Okay. An example there, so if I ask myself this question, what field settings can I use to encourage the batter to play a high risk shot? I can leave cover open and mid wicket open because I want to encourage a batter to, play, to go away from their plan and hit across the line. Remember, I'm bowling fuller and straighter, swinging the ball away. All right? So if I get the batter to either open the face and hit through cover or turn the face and close the face and hit through mid wicket, then I'm a really, really big chance of getting those slips into play because they're playing with half a bat. Right? I don't want them showing the full face hitting down the ground. I want them to try and go, oh, there's a gap there at cover. There's an easy boundary or an easy two. Open the face. Schnick, thanks for coming. Or vice versa. Oh, there's a gap there at mid-wicket. I might just try and turn my hands on it and get a one, two or four. Close the face a bit early. Schnick. Thanks for coming. Leading edge, back to me. Thanks for coming. So you're just trying to have that thought process, all right? If I'm turning the ball away, what's a high risk shot against turning the ball away? If I'm turning the ball in to the batter, what's a high risk shot? So I'll ask a few examples. If I'm a leg spin bowler, where do you think I want to try and encourage the, um, the batter to hit? Leg spin bowler, what have you been taught before? Do you want to hit with the spin? So when you're batting, what have you been taught to do? Hit with the spin or against the spin? All right, with. So everyone's saying with. So you've got to try and transfer yourself from bowler to batter here sometimes as well. If I've been taught before, it's safer to hit with the spin. So that's through the covers, through point. If I'm a leg spin bowler, where do I want the batter to hit? Leg side, cow corner, mid wicket. We want them to try and turn their hands and go against the spin. Yep. So we might leave mid wicket open as a leg spin bowler to try and encourage that. If I'm an off spin bowler, where do I want the batter to hit? Where do you see Nathan Lyon leave open a lot? Offside, particularly if it's turning, what's a really high risk shot? What type of cover? Do you think you would move your cover a bit straighter and leave square open or move cover squarer and leave straight cover open? Yeah, for those that have said, you often see off-spin bowlers, they leave like from gully all the way to like extra cover open. They want to try and encourage, when it's really turning, they want to try and encourage a batter to cut against the spin and to square drive against the spin because that's a really high risk shot. All right. For an in-swing bowler, where is it really easy to hit in-swing bowling when you're batting? Down the ground, straight, yes, mid-wicket, leg side. Yeah, we're going with the swing. So we're hitting either straight, full face of the bat, or we're turning the hands with the swing. So for me, as an in-swing bowler, 
again, it, it's very similar to off-spin bowling. We might leave that really square cover open and try and get them to open the face there so we can beat the bat and either hit the pads or hit the stumps. All right, and you can see there, guys, if you go through and ask those four questions, I can guarantee you you'll have a lot better field. You'll have a lot smarter fields when you play. All right, do you think that's easy? Can you remember that process? Can you start applying that to your game? The four questions again. Let's go through them. Where am I trying to bowl the ball? Number one. Who can, if I execute, what shot is the batsman most likely to play? If I execute, how am I most likely to get a wicket? What field settings can I use to encourage a batter to play a high risk shot? All right. Now, really quickly, common risks or common, sorry, not risks, common big mistakes that captains and bowlers make when they're setting fields, particularly in junior cricket. Mistake number one, reactive fields. All right, go back, reactive fields. So what that means is putting fielders in spots where the batter has scored runs. All right, and it's a different story. Like if you've, if you've bowled to your plan and you've executed and the batter's scored runs there, you know, three, four, five times and they're continually doing that, that's a different story. You need to make a change and either change your bowling plan or block that spot up. But don't move the field. Don't move the field in reaction to one shot. So if you bowl a good ball, the batter plays a big shot, whacks you over mid on, don't just put a deep mid on just because they've played one shot there. All right? It, who said that there? Hunter, that is so common. Yeah, it is, mate. We see it all. Even in senior cricket, I see it where a batter plays one big shot and the captain puts a fielder out there straight away. And then, you know, next over, they'll play another big shot over mid off and they'll put a fielder there straight away and bring the other one up. Right, smart batsmen do that for a reason. They'll play, they'll play the captain like that. So you want to keep saying to the batter, right, oh, yes, you hit that one for four, but I want to see you do it three or four times before I change the field. Because what a batter does is go, right, if I can go bang there and they put a fielder out, that's an easy one for me for the rest of the game or the rest of the innings. Right, so you want to try and force them to do it a few times. And if they keep trying, they make a mistake, you get their wicket. Right, big mistake number two. Who's seen this before? Who don't? I think I saw someone type in the chat box before that your your coach sets the field and you just rotate around. That's exactly what I would call a cookie cutter field. Right, if you're just rotating from one spot to the next, and I know you know they might do it to save time and that, but if there's any parents that coach teams listening in or you know, if you're a captain of a team, I really, really encourage you, even if it's an under-10s team or an under-12s team, you need to start setting fields for different bowlers and actually setting, thinking about proper fields rather than just putting everyone on the ring and rotating around. Yeah, you need to think about the batter as well. Chris, that, that's fine if you don't have a full-time captain. Um, you know, th there's still going to be leaders in the team. There, sh there still should be a handful of leaders that can actually talk to the captain on the day and help them make decisions. If not, you personally as a bowler need to take the reins and go, right, if I'm not happy with the captain's knowledge today, I'm going to set my own field. Right? You have control. You should have the last say as a bowler. Right? Big mistake number three is setting fields for bad bowling. Again, we see it all the time. You know, if you personally or whoever the bowler is, if you're the captain, if the bowler can't execute and bowl to the field and bowl to the plan that you've set as a team and a captain, it's time for a spell, right? You need to go and get your mindset right. You need to go and start again. You should never, ever set fields for bad balls. Again, I see it a lot where a bowler drags a couple down outside off and they put a sweeper out and a deep point out and then they drag one down on the leg side, bang, put a deep square leg out and a deep mid wicket out. All of a sudden, 
it just gets really, really easy. And the batters are scoring five, six, seven and over. And there's just no pressure on them whatsoever. So, you know, you don't want to go too harsh and drag a bowler straight away after one bad over. You want to give them a chance. But if they're bowled two or three overs and they're not settling in, they're bowling bad balls and you have to start moving the field based on their bad balls, give them a spell. Or same goes, if you're bowling, put your hand up and go, look, I'm, you know, I'm struggling at the moment. Maybe give me a rest, give someone else a bowl. I'll get my head right and then we'll start again. Right, but always set your fields based on your um, based on your plan, based on what you're trying to execute, not bad bowling. Siddharth Berendorf was talking about setting fields for misdirected delivery. I don't know what you mean there. The one thing that I would um, where I would not recommend this is for young wrist spinners or young spinners. You know, I, I think you do have to give them a little bit of protection. It's like it's unrealistic to think a 10, 11, 12, 13-year-old leg spinner is going to bowl six good balls. So in that situation, you need to go, right, what is my most common bad ball? It might be a drag down ball on leg stump. So you give them a deep square leg and you give them a sweeper. But when you do that, you've got to have what we call an in-out field. So you've got your, your fielders on the fence protecting those bad balls, but then everyone else has got to be in nice and tight on the one and try and put the pressure on the batters. But I definitely do think you need to give young wrist spinners uh, a bit of protection because otherwise you're just going to ruin their confidence. So wrist spinners need to get into their spell. How many wrist spinners have we got on here at the moment? And what would you say, guys, like, you know, how do you feel? Do you like a little bit of protection so that you can settle into your spell? And does it annoy you when you get dragged after one or two bad overs and mess with your mind a little bit? No, yes, nope. Yeah, some people are really mentally tough and they take that as a, that as a challenge, but... Uh, and look, if you're a really confident spinner and you're confident of hitting your, your plans and that, you, you don't have to have fielders out for your bad ball. But if you're a young spinner and you still find that you bowl two or three bad balls and over, you need to give yourself protection. Otherwise, every time you bowl, you'll get one or two overs and get dragged off and then you're not going to learn your craft. I was a leggy lock and what happened? Why'd you quit? I know a lot of spinners quit because they... They do bowl those two or three bad balls and then they, they get dragged and then they go, oh, I'm just going to bowl pace then because they're too, too scared to bowl leg spin or their coach tells them, no, we just need you to bowl tight, so you're going to bowl pace. If you love bowling spin and you want to bowl spin, I really encourage you to stick with it right out in the tough years where you bowl those couple of ball, bad balls. All right, guys, that's the end of my you know, structured presentation. Uh, I hope you learned something out of that. I hope you um, took something you can take away from that. I'm going to hang around for 10 minutes or so for questions if you have any. If you, uh, if you need to go and you don't want to sit around for the live Q&A, you're more than welcome to go now. Um, as I said at the start, I encourage you to write those four questions down if you haven't because I can guarantee it'll make a big, big difference to your game if you start applying that. But I'm going to stop. Charlie, see you, mate. Dano, thanks, mate. No worries. Peter Crawford, question one. Where are we? Where am I trying to bowl the ball? Is that the one you want? Does any anyone else need any of these slides up? Aditya, see you, mate. What do you need? Pop in what you've missed if you want to have a quick look at something else. Tanish, yeah, I will upload the the 10 minute challenge, mate. Uh, it's in Facebook. If you're not on Facebook, it'll be on YouTube tomorrow night. Thanks, Pete. Thanks for jumping on, mate. 